April, I just got a message from Rob. He, I think he's trying to join the meeting, but he may not. He might be using the wrong link. Okay, we are live now. I sent him an invite a second ago. I'll touch base with him. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, I, I'd like to remind everyone that a school workshop, <clears throat> or it's, excuse me, a school board workshop is intended for discussion purposes only and no board action will be taken. Uh, I'd like to do a roll call of participants. Jen Alexander. Here. Abigail Miller. Here. <laughs> Rob Hudson. We'll come back to him. Paul Marcosian. Here. Okay, thank you. Um, for public participation, public comment can be made through the question and the answer. Um, button by or by sending an email to our Ellsworth School Board Vice Chair Paul Marcosian at pmarcosian at ellsworthschools.org and if you are submitting questions we are asking that you provide your full name. <laughs> Item A on the agenda is the discussion a request to paint the crosswalks at EMS and EHS. I believe I need a uh, motion. Uh, Mr. Can Thomas, may I make a recommendation? I know we yep. have some panelists here tonight, um, and I think it might be uh, beneficial to the board and to the members of the public. Um, if Mrs. Cutney, um, who is the uh, advisor of the GSDA group, if she'd like to take a couple of minutes okay. and speak on behalf of the request that's before the board for the board to discuss this evening, if Mrs. Cutney is prepared okay. to do that. Okay, thank you. Ms. I certainly am. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm the advisor to the GSDA at the Ellsworth High School, which is the Gender Sexuality Diversity Alliance. And we continued to have Wednesday after school meetings via Zoom during the quarantine. And during the month of May, the students were talking about what they could do during Pride Month, which is June, um, to show their pride and to do something bright and cheerful during the dregs of the quarantine, really. Nobody was having a good time. And they came up with the idea of painting some crosswalks around town um, and at the schools in particular um, to show their pride and to celebrate diversity and really to do sort of an anti-bullying effort. We see this project as twofold. The first part of it is a celebration of pride, um, diversity, and not merely tolerance of the LGBTQ community, but appreciation and value and you know, welcome members of our community. The second part really is the anti-bullying effort. Um, if you look at the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey, and I'm gonna post the statistics, I will not bore you with each and every one, um, but I will post that um, in the Facebook comments if, so people can look at it. Um, if you look at things like violence, bullying, harassment, feeling safe at school, um, suicidal ideation, lots of horrible things, um, tend to affect the LGBTQ community the most in our school system. Um, the one statistic that I will give you is that 63% of LGBTQ students, high school students in the state of Maine as of 2019, felt that 63% of the adults in their community did not support them, did not welcome them and that they did not matter to their communities. As a teacher, as a parent, as a community member in Ellsworth, 
I feel that we would be negligent to not take action. Recently, Ellsworth has come up with the Rachel's Challenge and the Kindness Begins With Me, and I think they're fantastic programs, and I think that is a fantastic slogan. I also sincerely believe that all of our policies should be evidence-driven, and if we really consider who are the kids who are being bullied, we really will make more progress solving those problems um, by, by using the data and the evidence. And so all of these things have come together. This idea was brought to me by the students, um, and therefore we are pursuing it, and we would really appreciate your support. Um, I, I would love to see it happen, and I'll answer any questions. And part of the reason we would really like to include EEMS in this, um, I assume there are probably some parents who are hesitant about the age range of students, you know, K through eight, is that bullying really starts long before ninth grade on this issue. Um, so if we're going to try to do a, an anti-bullying initiative, we really need to start um, at an age that we, we can successfully achieve what, we're, what our goals are. So anyway, so that is sort of a summation of what we're looking to achieve. Any questions from board members? I fully support this idea. I feel like this is a long time coming. We, um, we need to make extra effort to have these students feel included and protected and part of our fabric of our society and not as outliers. And I feel like this is a great way to show that we care about them as much as we care about anybody. The suicide rate between transgender teens is 70%, 70. They don't grow up hating themselves. They learn to hate themselves through society not being there for them, for continually letting them down and continually telling them that they're bad people. I feel like this is a big start in changing that, improving that. And this is a great project that's going to beautify the school and the town in one of the most you know, colorful, easiest ways we can do it. I do have a question, if it's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Carrie, I know um, you had mentioned or that there were other um, cities around the state that have done this. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask if those were done just in and amongst the city or if they were done on school property? I'm not certain about Bangor. Um, the two cities that I'm familiar with are Bangor and South Portland. In South Portland, I had contacted on Friday um, one of the workers in the public works department and she said that they strategically placed their crosswalks around town um, in places for high vi visibility, excuse me. Um, and they did put one in front of the high school. Um, but it was on a city street. It was not actually on school grounds. So, you know, that might change things. I'm not really certain about, you know, the legalities of it in terms of is it city council, is it school board, um, but they did do city streets around town. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. may, may I um, add to that, Mrs. Thomas? Yes. Uh, there's also a school in Portland, the Ocean Avenue Elementary School. Uh, their civil rights team invited the community community to uh, help paint uh, a rainbow sidewalk in their community. I also support this idea. I, I think that um, LGBTQ community is um, I think of my generation. I'm going to go back a long way. <laughs> I think of my generation and I think it's wonderful to support we're working to support the people this population, the sexually diverse population, and that didn't happen in my generation. And there are a lot of people that I can think of that, that fell by the wayside for with um, 
issues of their own, suicide, et cetera, because there was no support group for them. And I think that by bringing this to the forefront of not only our schools, but our community, it's the right thing to do. I'm wondering if we can hear from uh, some of the students who are here tonight. I don't know if I'm going out of turn, but if you'd like, I could speak to it. Um, I, I really like this idea because I think it would be a great way to show support um, and just kind of, it would be, it would be a really nice thing to see like, Hey, you're not like being ostracized. You're being welcomed, right? To see like in full view in the middle of the street, like, you're, you're welcome here. Um, and I think that the only idea that we could see as like a real, like anything bad happening would be like an outlet for its destruction, right? But as we saw in Portland, as we saw in Bangor, as we saw even at Ellsworth with the GSCA cabinet, none of those things happened. I think to assume that that would happen would be a few and far between leap of judgment. And I think that that would not be the outcome. I think it would work wondrously. Um, sorry, can I say something? Yes, um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm the former president of the GSDA um, for, I think, two years, and then before that I was the vice president. So I've always been really involved in the GSDA and supporting uh, the community at Ellsworth High School. Um, I just graduated, so I won't really be doing that, but I'm trying to do it from afar now. Um, so I think this project is really important because um, a lot of students feel that although the adults never really, like, condemn like say like oh uh, you shouldn't be LGBTQ like they never really support it either and so just seeing something in the street that really explicitly says like we support you we value you as people and members of our community is really important and it's just something that you it's hard to imagine you know when it's never you've never really seen something like that but when you see it and you it fills you with joy <laughs> and um yeah, not, it's not even just a statement of um, acceptance and celebration, but it is beautifying our school. It is um, making, you know, a crosswalk that was used to be white, a welcoming, you know, you have to drive over that street to enter the high school. It's a really welcoming thing to see when you drive in, especially for prospective students. Um, I know like coming in from eighth grade into freshman year, it's really intimidating. The high school is really big. Um, and so seeing something like that, if you are in that part of like a minority like that, it's just a wonderful feeling. It's a really nice saying, I'm accepted here, I'm welcome here, and I'm celebrated here. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I, oh, sorry. Thomas, I have a <clears throat> couple of uh, public participation messages have come in via email. Okay. Is this a good time to share those? Yes, please. All right. Um, one is from Diane Hessler, who says, hello, I am a taxpayer in Ellsworth who votes in another state. I think this proposal is a great way to support LGBTQ in a beautiful way. I'd love to see these downtown. I'd love to see these downtown as well as in the schools. And then I got one other. Um, this one's a little bit longer. Uh, this is from <clears throat> Samuel Bannister. He says, I have three children that attend EEMS with two more that will be going eventually. I am very disappointed to hear that the Ellsworth School Department is considering painting these rainbow crosswalks. 
I feel like the Ellsworth school system has done an excellent job staying neutral when it comes to these types of situations. And I was ecstatic when we left the RSU district because it meant we didn't have to be forced to teach curriculum that we felt wasn't appropriate. This type of message is not something for our classrooms, especially not for elementary and middle school children. My six-year-old son doesn't need to be aware of the sexual preference of anyone. And when, it, and when it comes time for that discussion, I should have the right as a parent to bring it up when I deem it to be necessary. This is a very device, he says decisive topic, but I think he means divisive. And it will only serve to drive a bigger wedge between groups of people. If you're going to paint cr rainbow crosswalks, then what about actual cross crosswalks to represent the Christian faith? or other crosswalks that represent the other percentages of lifestyles. Where do we draw the line? I'm not asking for any preferential treatment for any represented group in our schools, and I am simply asking that our school system remain neutral and teach acceptance across the board for all walks of life. And I'm wondering if um, any of the Panelists who are here tonight to advocate for this have a response. I'd be happy to respond to that. I think our, you know, our schools celebrate a lot of different holidays and there's, there's really no oppression of, especially of Judeo-Christian religions in our area. There's no history of that. Um, it's not invisible. It's something that's very visible. We have a lot of churches right on the main street with a lot of uh, messages on their billboards, and I think that's wonderful. And if they wanted to paint something in an area, if they wanted to, to do something like that, um, you know, you can't mix church and state because there's that wall, but this isn't a religious issue. This is just a, an issue of support. And when we have kids that are literally attempting suicide at three and four times the rates of um, non-LGBTQ youth, depending on, you know, if they're gay, gay lesbian, and bisexual, it's three times, and, and transgender children are, I think, four times, or I might be confusing the two, but it's three and four times the rates. I mean, that's, that's terrifying. We're not, we're not even talking about suicidal ideation. We're talking about suicide attempts. We need to provide this support. We need to provide this uh, you know, this is the least, just a step in the right direction. It's not, certainly not the be all and end all, but we need to show that all of our children's lives are important and that we care about them and that we love them. And I don't think that you would have to address sexuality with a six-year-old that sees rainbow colored crosswalks. You could just walk across the crosswalk and say, oh, look at the pretty colors. If you're not comfortable addressing that with a six-year-old, I don't think you would have to at that point. That's a conversation for later. If you're so inclined to have that later. Um, my kids grew up knowing people who were married in, in same-sex relationships, but they didn't, we didn't discuss sex with them. They, we just discussed that, you know, Elizabeth and Edith are married. That's all they knew. And it, it didn't, I don't think they thought about anybody's sex life until they were teenagers or whatever, whenever kids normally think about that. Um, I'd like to add something as well. Um, the, since I'm thinking a lot about curriculum, um, I've been talking with Tara um, from Healthy Acadia and with um, Carrie, and we have been discussing starting a civil rights team at the middle school. Um, Maggie Curtis is a teacher at the school that wants to be involved with this as well. Um, and the nice thing about a civil rights team at the middle level is that we're talking about the diversity of all of us. And those are about the freedom that all of us have to be ourselves. And so it's not focused on a particular way of life, but it's talking about how people are different and celebrating that and, and being unique. Um, so I think that that's um, a way of starting those conversations at emotionally and developmentally appropriate times in the lens of civil rights. And so this is, one aspect of that, of talking about a way in which some people are different than others. And there's so many other aspects. We've heard so many other ways in which we wanna discuss that and have kids learn about people who are different from them. Um, we want people to not just be tolerant, but to be accepting. And so I think 
that the expansion of our programs and our plans to do that is really important. I mean, I'm thinking in the elementary schools about expanding our libraries and making sure that kids uh, who are different in so many different ways get to see themselves in children's books. And so, I mean, there's so many ways that we can celebrate diversity and uniqueness in kids. And I think this is just one way to do this for a group of kids who are feeling that they're not um, able to be unique and, and celebrated. So I, I would agree about the idea that the painting in itself is something that little kids enjoy. They love bright colors. And um, I, I think that this will fit in to uh, ways in which we are working with our curriculum to celebrate diversity throughout um, our school district in the future. We'll be seeing more and hearing more about its civil rights team developing. So I am excited about that. Mrs. Thomas, I received one other comment and it um, kind of ties into a question I had as well. So this is from Janice Frost. We are all for supporting the rights of everyone. However, will these crosswalks be recognized by drivers? And how does the Maine Department of Public Safety and lawyers view these crosswalks if painted differently? Um, and my question was, where, where exactly um, was, are, are these crosswalks being considered on I'm assuming we're talking about school property here. So question about the main DO, main Department of Public Safety and I, and I suppose the main DOT as well, but also where um, on school grounds are we looking at doing this? I think um, we're open to discussion about that in terms of where the best place for that to be would be. Um, when we first started this, we were actually thinking about the actual crosswalks because that is what the, the other towns have done. Um, the main Department of Transportation has revised its crosswalk policy to include um, adding the rainbow crosswalks or doing what they call fills and fill color into the crosswalk between the white spaces. They have very specific guidelines and regulations on how you can do this to keep it safe and to keep it 100% legal. Um, so for example, you have to retain some of the white reflective paint in certain spots. Um, but as far as the main Department of Transportation is concerned, these are considered 100% legal. And then they have some other stipulations. For example, any road that's higher than 25 miles per hour, you cannot paint. You have to leave them as regular crosswalks. So, you know, we couldn't do this on State Street between like Dunkin' Donuts and the high school because that speed limit is higher than 25 miles per hour. It would not be legal. Um, but say something on, you know, Forest Ave or Newitt Circle or Lee Jock Street, like by the high school, those crosswalks, we could do that. Now, if we wanted to paint something like at a crosswalk on school grounds, that would be, we'd be open to that discussion as well. Okay, I think that we only have jurisdiction over our schoolyards. We don't have anything beyond our, you know, Newitt Circle or, or Lee Jock Street ends up being city, the city's decision, not our decision. So that's all we can, that's all we govern is mm -hmm. our particular piece of property. Yes, when I was contacted by the city manager's office, they directed me to ask permission to the superintendent. And so that's sort of how we started down this path. Um, okay. I would love to see crosswalks on school property. I think that would be fantastic. And I think that would speak volumes of what the school is willing to stand for in terms of including all of their students. So I'm glad we're having this discussion. And just to back up what um, Mrs. Thomas said and also what Mrs. Cutney said, um, I think the request before the board tonight is for the painting of the crosswalks on school property. Because as Mrs. Thomas said, the right. school board's purview is only school property. They, they don't have any governance rights over um, any of the city streets. So, and, and I think that's what most people are thinking in their comments tonight. And by the way, I appreciate all the comments here. Um, wonderful. Um, but please know the board's consideration is just school property. Perfect. Paul, there are a couple of comments in the Q&A here. Did you see those? 
Yeah, I think he's I think he's already given those. Mrs. Miller? I just wanted to add to that. Um, one other thing I thought we could do besides the crosswalks would be to have a few nice um, late summer planters um, that could be painted in the same way because the terracotta planters are, are not terribly expensive and have a few here and there just to complement it and bring the the, the color into other areas around the school would be quite nice too and possibly even downtown. Something that, you know, could be just out for the season because they're not going to survive the winter, but, you know, could also be brought out at another time as well. Just as a secondary, you know, platform. Again, all that has to go through the city council. <laughs> No, no. Be, well, but for the school, we could do it at the right. school. We could have a few nice planters with, you know, mm -hmm. same patterns and whatnot. Okay. It would beautify the school and bring a lot of color and just be very good to look at. I don't think this is something that we have to explain to young children in any other form. You know, when I introduce my child to friends and relatives who are divorced, I don't say um, so-and-so has two mommies because this marriage didn't work out and now this and that, or this is what they do in the bedroom. That conversation doesn't happen. It's just, there. She, she has two mommies, she has two daddies because they are now remarried. We don't think about, well, what conversations we have to have come along with that. And I don't believe we really need to think about what conversations come along with this in that terms. You, you, I, I think it's up to each individual parent to, to decide when and what they say about these to their children. Okay. Okay. Any further comments? Um, this is Thomas. There's two comments in the uh, yes. Q and A. Uh, Chris Popper says that uh, Van Gore's sidewalk is down by the bridge where Charlie Howard was thrown into the Penobscot River. And then Joanne uh, says, this is a great idea. I love it. Is DOK, is DOT okay with not white crosswalks? And I think we covered that uh, question earlier. So that's all I've got. Oh, I, do, I have a question though, um, myself. Um, how this is uh, to paint crosswalks is going to require um, a little bit of expense because we have to there'll be paint and materials. How, um, how will this be financed? Um, I was talking, when I was started talking with the young people from the GSDA group, I, I had some money to follow through with whatever their ideas were. And so we are, uh, Healthy Acadia is going to be buying the paint. This won't cost the school anything. And then I had some further conversations with um, some other organizations and Heart of Ellsworth very generously donated, uh, agreed to donate all of the supplies. So Healthy Acadia will be supplying the paint. Part of Ellsworth will be supplying the rollers and the tape, and um, we have to scrub the crosswalks and clean them before we can paint them. So all of those supplies, um, Heart of Ellsworth, so this will cost the school absolutely nothing. And if we get the city council on board as well, this will not cost the city anything if we can get some city crosswalks done as well. Good evening, everyone. Sorry for starting late. Uh, I was on the wrong link for the meeting had several that went out today and I picked the wrong one. Um, my question would be um, to the students that are, that are on this, on this meeting. Um, let's just say that you could, there was a way that say starting from sixth graders up to seniors in high school, if you could actually take a vote on this. What do you think the outcome would be from the student body? Um, I can speak to this. Um, so the student body, I think, um, it's obviously been a while since I was in the sixth grade, but I think uh, curiosity at first, and then um, I think after the first couple months, it would probably um, lose its novelty to anybody not in the community. But um, I think anyone in the community would immediately recognize this as a sense of celebration. And um, like uh, support, that's the word I'm looking for. And um, I think other people, it probably wouldn't cross their mind too much. They would simply say, like, you know, look at it as a rainbow crosswalk. 
um, once you get into high school, I think, um, I think seeing something that's um, supportive and um, tolerant would significantly uh, make students consider what they're saying first. Because I personally have heard a lot of like inappropriate language, like bullying and uh, things that about the LGBT community that should never be said, especially in our schools. And I think seeing something that says like all the adults in the school say like that we should support these people would make them think twice before they bully someone or say something. Oh. Thank you. If I could, I would like to just add about, about this group overall. Um, you know, they do, there's a lot of terrific kids in this group and uh, they're um, always coming up with ideas to improve our school. And they usually have two or three good projects, projects that are well-meaning and uh, make an impact to our school each year. And so whenever they come forward to me with an idea or something that they want to do, I always listen because I know that they have done their research. Um, I know that they're well intended. And um, I know that overall it's a, it's a really high functioning group. Um, and they take a lot of pride in their work. And um, it, they're, it's always well thought out. And you know, when I saw this idea from Mrs. Cutney, you know, immediately I, I was proud of them because they want to reach out to the community, not just the school community, but the overall Ellsworth community. Um, you know, and I think that's special because it, it is a special group of kids. You know, it really is. And, and um, it's, it's one of our, our better groups in our school. I think we have a lot of them, um, but just they're always well intended and um, they just want what's best for the school and what's best for the community. I would just like to add um, that this group found a problem. They found a solution. They procured a grant for funding. They contacted elected officials, government officials. Um, I couldn't be more proud of them as a group of students. And I, I feel like they've done all the things that we want our teenagers to do to be engaged citizens in their community. And I'm, I'm very pleased about that. And I'm very proud of you guys. So thank you. Anyone else? I just want to remind you that we don't vote <laughs> at a workshop meeting. We'll be voting um, on this at our August meeting, August 11th. Um, and we want to thank you all for your comments and for answering our questions and for keeping us informed. Um, I'm quite impressed. Thank you. May, may I add, Mrs. Thomas, that I am um, appreciate all the, um, everyone who contributed to the discussion tonight, and I'm especially appreciative and um, have admiration for the students who came forward to this meeting and presented their views. Um, very well said and uh, very persuasive, so thank you for that. Also, thank you, Mrs. Cutney, and thank you, Ms. Young, for um, for coming along as well and, and everyone else who, again who participated. So I'm feeling supportive of this um, project. I also echo Mr. Markosian's comments. I truly appreciate our staff members and our students and our graduate for coming in and speaking very eloquently this evening. I uh, truly appreciate um, all that you do uh, and know that you're, you guys are very much supported. So thank you for being here this evening. Thank you for having us. <clears throat> Mrs. Thomas, um, shall I make a motion at this point? I believe we consider going to executive session. Yes, please. Okay, I make a motion that we go into executive session. Second. Um, just, just to clarify, the motion is under, is that under one MRSA 4056E for the purpose of consultation with the district's attorney? Is that the motion in a second? Yes, yes, thank you, Dan, for clarifying that. I didn't have the full wording in front of me, but that's- Thank you. 
Do I have a second? Yep. Second. Thank you. Okay. Um, discussion? I guess we'll be right. returning to the workshop meeting. Yes. Is that right? After executive session, we have another agenda item. Yes. yes, after the executive session, you'll be returning as a board and there'll be an update on the uh, status of the planning for the return to school framework. <clears throat> yep. And board, board members, um, as you will be going, there will be another Zoom invitation that you have for a separate meeting. Um, and I will go and start that meeting presently. Okay. Once you vote. Yeah. Okay. We're going to vote. Um, Jen Alexander. Yes. Abigail Miller. Yes. Rob Hudson. Yes. Paul Marcosian. Yes. And I vote yes, 5 0. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. April. Thank you, April. Okay, we're live, Mrs. Thomas. Thank you. Okay. Item B on our agenda, update and discussion of fall 2020 return to the school framework. Mrs. Thomas, could I uh, go ahead and start with that? Sure. I'd like to thank everybody who's still here with us and uh, held on uh, after the board completed its executive session. But um, even with regard to the lateness of the hour, I'd like to just run through uh, some updates for the board and our uh, public. Um, even though we'll talk about the survey a little bit later in my, my brief remarks, I just wanna thank everybody who was able to fill out the survey that was distributed last week. Um, and just as a reminder, the responses that you provided are not binding. You know, we did send out a second reminder that tried to clarify that. Even though they're not binding, however, they're important to moving forward the planning process. And we're gonna talk about how we're gonna move forward to get inf excuse me, information from people that um, were not able to fill out the survey. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, um, in addition to the uh, update I'm going to provide, we have many members of the planning group who are here with us tonight. Um, just so you know, our school nurses are not here, but have provided me with some information to share. Um, and also, if we have questions for them, they're, they're prepared to take them, and they are meeting with Dr. McGregor on a regular basis, and also with the school nurses at the Department of Ed. Uh, Chuck Turnbull is not here tonight, but the things he has been working on are the logistical details of the cleaning and disinfecting, um, placing of the floor markings, arrows, and six-foot spaces and working to, uh, with our providers to ensure that our HVA systems are in compliance with the department's framework. Um, also, Food uh, Service Director Daly, I have not seen him yet. He's not here this evening, but the plans he's been working on are how we're gonna be able to feed our students, both who are in school in person, and if we have students who are in remote programs, how we're gonna service them. And as we'll talk about with the survey, um, we have some information on how many students would like to access that if they are remote. Uh, but that would, with that being said, we'd like to talk um, a couple of the things are included in the letter that I sent out to all of our staff members and all of our families and members of the board, you got it. Included in that letter were links to the Department of Education's uh, framework for return to school. Um, there are a couple of se sections that I wanna focus on specifically. Um, the first one is um, just an acknowledgement that the framework has changed several times since June 11th. I noticed that there's been an update since July 17th already. I have not seen the specifics, but couple of uh, specific areas to talk about. One is the color coding risk of transmission uh, system that's gonna be put out July 31st and also the health and safety requirements. Um, so one of the things that um, changed with the Department of Ed's framework that I think is going to clarify the framework process is first and foremost in part one, physical health and safety. 
Um, as of July 31st, each county in Maine is going to be assigned or categorized as a red, a yellow, or a green county. And it's based upon a holistic assessment of quantitative and qualitative information that Dr. Shaw outlined on Friday the 17th in their press conference. I'm just going to read those quickly so people understand. Categorization as a red county suggests the county has a high risk of COVID-19 spread and that in-person instruction should not be conducted. Categorization as a yellow suggests that the county has an elevated risk of COVID-19 spread and that hybrid instruction models should be adopted. Categorization as green suggests that the county has a relatively low COVID-19 risk and that in-person instruction can be adopted Although an SAU may opt for hybrid instruction, if it's buildings or readiness, make adhering to the required health and safety measures for all schools a challenge. Okay. Um, so there's gonna be a designation that our county is given. Um, I think many people are speculating what that will be. Um, I've even speculated myself, but I'm not gonna put out there what I think because we, we don't know that there are some sets of data that they're using um, that may cause us to have a surprise. But with regard to that, that will be out on July 31st. Um, and it's important to know that that is going to be updated every two weeks. That data is going to be reviewed and updated every two weeks. So we will be looking for that. The, the other piece that's important to know is that there are a set of health and safety requirements that we are, we are required to adhere to. They're not options, but they are required to. And one piece I want to read is, the red, yellow, and green categorization needs to be used in conjunction with being able to adhere to the health and safety requirements. So even if Hancock County were listed as a green county, meaning that we can adopt in-person instruction, we are still required, and I'm reading this directly from the department's framework, these requirements apply to all risk levels, including green designation. So here are the specific things, and we did include them in my letter, we did include them in the heading of the survey, First thing that we have to have in place is symptom screening before coming to school. So students and staff members must conduct self checks for symptoms prior to boarding buses or entering school buildings each day. Um, one of the things our nurses are working on is the information that we can provide to our families and the things that they have to check on before deciding to send their children to school. Any person showing tip symptoms must report symptoms and not be present at school. And schools must provide clear and accessible directions to parents and caregivers and students for reporting the symptoms. You know, this is something that's gonna require a change for all of us. You know, we all work in jobs and we have students who wanna to come to school. Many times we may not feel particularly well in the morning and sometimes we, we're, we're just gonna trudge through. You know, it's not that bad, I just don't feel that well. Um, I should still go to work. We have students that may have a test on a particular day. They're gonna struggle through and they're gonna to come to school. Given what we're dealing with, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we could be transmitting a virus. So we need to do a screening check before coming to school. Again, school nurses are working on that. Physical distancing and facilities. Um, adults must maintain a six, foot, six feet of distance from others to the extent possible. Maintaining three feet of distance is acceptable between and among students when combined with other measures. Um, there are some other pieces in there that talk about six feet of distancing required for students while eating breakfast and lunch because they will be able to be wear masks, wearing masks that, at that time. One of the things I want to clarify for everybody watching is when we first saw this on Friday the 17th, we looked at it as so, okay, we can go to three feet of distance now. Okay. Uh, but in, in looking at that language and working with our school health advisors um, and looking at some practical pieces in regard to being in schools and student movement, um, in addition to two webinars with the DOE, the six feet distance is actually the standard. The three feet is acceptable between and among students under a series of different circumstances. So one thing I would ask people to think about, if you're in a classroom, put yourself in there as either a teacher or having been a student, and your desks are placed three feet apart, if you're a student that has to walk up an aisle to either see the teacher or be excused to go to the bathroom, you cannot maintain three to feet of distance between you and another student. If your desks are placed six feet apart and you walk up that aisle, you are able to maintain a three foot distance. So the standard we're looking for in our planning for the framework for returning to school is a six feet distance um, with an acceptable distance of three feet in those situations where students are walking up an aisle like I gave an example for, or passing from a class to another. Um, so it's important to understand that. 
Masks and face coverings. Um, in previous versions, uh, masks and face coverings were highly recommended. Now I'm just gonna read directly from what we're required to do. Adults, including educators and staff, are required to wear a mask and face covering. Students age two and above are required to wear a mask face covering that covers their nose and mouth. Masks and face coverings must be worn by all students on the bus. Uh, questions that I got from a couple of parents, what about my student has a medical issue that may prevent them from wearing a mask? Okay. Face shields may be an alternative for those students with medical, behavioral, or other challenges who are unable to wear masks or face coverings, and that also applies to staff. So I wanna make clear to everyone, masks are a requirement. They're not a suggestion, they are a requirement for all students and staff. Um, another set of requirements is hand hygiene, which is something that um, we've been focusing on since COVID became uh, evident on the horizon back in February and March. All students and staff in school must receive training in proper hand hygiene. Um, we have videos for that, that's something the school nurses are working on. All students and staff must wash hands or use sanitizing gel upon entering the school, before and after eating, before and after donning or removing a face mask, after using the restroom, before and after use of playgrounds and shared equipment, and upon entering and exiting a school bus. Okay. Personal protective equipment. Um, additional safety precautions are required for school nurses and or any staff supporting students in close proximity when distance is not possible or when students require physical assistance. These precautions must at a minimum include eye protection, face shield or goggles, mask face covering. Uh, we also have gowns uh, that will be coming. Classrooms and or areas that have been used by an individual diagnosed with COVID-19 must be closed off until thorough cleaning and sanitization takes place. Okay. Final piece on those uh, six items is return to school after illness. Six staff members and students must use home isolation until they meet the criteria for returning to school. And again, I sent links out there, but th those, those pieces, folks, are requirements. They are not options. Um, any questions on that before I move on to survey results? So survey results, again, I wanna thank everybody who took the time to complete the most recent survey. Um, the surveys we uh, re have received uh, through the end of the day yesterday, and actually Rachel left them open until midnight last night, uh, account for 503 of our students out of approximately 1,350. So based upon what we received, 77.5% um, or 390 prefer in-person instruction, while 22.5% or 113 prefer to participate in a remote program. So a couple of things I wanna clarify for the board and for our members of our public. Okay, again, the responses are not binding. The purpose was to determine the number of families and students who would prefer to return to in-person instruction in compliance with health and safety requirements, and the number who would prefer to participate in a remote learning program with clear guidelines with regard to attendance, scheduling, instruction, communication, et cetera. We want these numbers to determine whether or not a start to school model based upon parental student choice would work with the overall capacity of our schools with regard to health and safety. In particular, the spacing that I just talked about, but also for traffic throughout the school. You know, if you think of a middle school or a high school where students change classes, you know, students who might be in science class for the first period, when they leave, they're not all going to math class. They may all be going to different classes. That's another part of the spacing piece that we need to consider. Okay. Um, what I gave you for numbers, um, what I gave you for numbers are the overall um, numbers. Rachel has uh, spent most of her day today, and Rachel, thank you very much for doing this, um, breaking down those numbers by grade level, and I believe she shared that with board members uh, in a spreadsheet um, maybe an hour or so ago. I think it was about the time that she was able to get all of that in there. And as you can see, it varies by grade level um, what the percentages of students who would like to be in an in-person program or would like to be in a remote program. Um, additionally, and we're still working on getting these disaggregated, although I think, well, Rachel, you may have these in the spreadsheet. We want to have information on the number of students who would prefer to, re who are preferring to return to school, who would use school transportation so that it would help Mr. Saunders in planning and scheduling bus routes. Uh, and also students who prefer a remote learning program who would still like to access our food service program so Mr. Daly can have that information to plan meals not only in school, but how we can get meals to students who are in a remote program. Okay. Now, while the number of responses we received does provide a solid baseline, second thing that Rachel was working on today, and again, Rachel, thank you very much for doing this, um, 
is taking the data and providing it to our building administrators so that they can start reaching out to phone by families who did not respond. So if you were not able to complete the survey and you get a call from the school over the next day or two, please answer the call because we're gonna be asking you those same questions. We wanna get as much information as possible. Okay. Um, and again, this was to help us determine whether or not a choice model, which would be a combination of in-person and remote learning um, would be possible. Um, I'll touch on this a little bit more in a minute, but a choice model to me removes more challenges than a model by which we have alternating schedules. Um, so we'll touch on that in just a minute. Um, in addition to the student numbers that we've been uh, collecting and uh, looking at, we're also working with our staff members to determine a couple of things. One, we know we're going to have staff who either have um, health or medical situations that prevent them from coming back to school or other reasons for being in a high risk category, but would be able to teach in a remote capacity. We're also working to determine how many of our staff members, regardless of their ability to return, might be willing to work in a remote capacity if the numbers bear out. So there's still some moving pieces there. So again, uh, Folks, if you haven't completed a survey and you get a call from the school, uh, we ask that you please answer it. Um, also with regard to the Department of Ed framework requirements, um, we've talked in previous meetings about looking at, in essence, three models, but uh, with the hybrid model, looking at a couple of them, one based on choice and one based on an alternating schedule. The DOE framework says that we need to plan three. One is in person, the second one is hybrid, and the third one is all remote. So. At this point in time, the in-person piece with all students and staff returning to the building, uh, based upon the numbers we received and the capacities that we have in our schools, we will not be able to have in-person instruction for all students in our schools and still meet the health and safety guidelines. When we're looking at the spacing in our rooms with six foot spacing between desks and also looking at tables that are six feet long and you can place students at either end of them, tables that are five feet long, you can put a piece of plexiglass in, um, we could safely accommodate between 65 and 70 percent of the students enrolled in our schools. So Ellsworth High School, we're looking at between 490 and 500 students. It means we could safely accommodate uh, maybe 70 percent of that. So take 570 percent, 340 to 350 students. The breakdowns would be similar at K through four and five through eight. With regard to HCTC, um, we're looking at different classroom structures and different class sizes, uh, but we're looking at probably a similar percentage. Um, we have received information from the Ellsworth High School students who um, attend HCTC, and I think we're still waiting to get some information on students from other schools who are attending and what their preference would be. So if we're not having in-person instruction for every student, um, by default, we're looking at a hybrid model. And just so that people understand, a hybrid model is a combination of students receiving in-person con instruction, consistent with health and safety guidelines, and remote instruction with clearly defined expectations that I talked about a few minutes ago. So with regard to hybrid, the survey was based upon hybrid based on family choice. In order for this to work, again, we need to have at least 30% of the families and students select a remote program. Right now, the overall numbers do not show that we can do that, um, but we still want to gather the numbers um, so that we can determine if we can do that across the system or potentially we may have some grade levels, and as you look at the numbers that Rachel provided, we have some grade levels that are pretty close to a 30% uh, selection of a remote program. Um, if we are not able to do a choice piece, um, we'll be looking at an alternative schedule, and this is something that our building administrators in the planning group are working on, and this is the instruction assessment group. Um, an alternating schedule model, which again would have a combination of in-person and remote instruction, but be based on a specific schedule that alternates. Um, and again, uh, some specific questions that may come up on that, I can let our uh, administrators or planning uh, group members talk a little bit about what they're looking at at their grade spans. The other, uh, other model that we have to look at and the one that we all hope does not come to pass again is full remote instruction. Um, plain and simple, what we're looking at with full remote instruction is if we have to be in that situation again, is that we have clearly defined expectations for attendance, communication, instruction, and scheduling so that the things that worked well last spring continue to work well, and the things that did not work so well um, are uh, corrected. Now, for the hybrid and remote model, um, one of the major questions that comes up is, what would we do with our children if we have to work? I continue to be in discussions with YMC Director Peter Farragher regarding 
uh, expanded options for childcare during the school day, which would hopefully accommodate families who have challenges in finding daycare, but also possibly include space for those who might be engaged in remote learning. So an example may be if we could find space so that students whose families participate in remote learning could be in the same location spaced properly and receive that and also have daycare at the same time. Um, the other piece, and, and this is something that's new on the horizon, when we sent the survey out, um, we did get a few questions saying, I need more information to answer this. The people that reached out directly to me, I had some excellent conversations with and they have subsequently completed the survey. But with a couple of those families, um, I received the question that said, a group of parents have, that I know have been talking about working together to provide space for students to participate in remote learning with adult supervision. So it may be four or five families working together where they take their children, they get a remote program. Now, some of them may be high school students, some of them may be elementary, but they can be in a space with adult supervision, which addresses a daycare piece. Um, so that, that is another possibility that um, was brought forth by parents. I, I really like that model. I, I think it requires some logistical planning, but one of the reasons I like it is it's emblematic of the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that we have seen um, since COVID came about and our schools closed. Um, so th those are the pieces that we're looking at right now. Um, and we can come back to questions here in a couple of minutes. Uh, another piece that I want uh, uh, board members to know, um, a proposed calendar change for the school year for next year. Um, have provided this to our uh, uh, Teachers Association uh, president uh, so that the uh, uh, Teachers Association can weigh in on it. Um, but what we're talking about is, as a means of providing our staff additional time to put plans in place for the start of the school year. Proposal that's gonna to come to the board is for a change in the start date for students from September 1st to September 8th. Okay. This would not be extending the school year on the other end. It would simply be taking as we did at the end of the 2019-20 school year, the first five student days and making them staff days so that staff members can finalize putting into place all the pieces that will be necessary to start the school year in a smooth and successful fashion. RSU 24 and RSU 25 have already made this change in their calendars. School Union 93, which encompasses schools on the Blue Hill Peninsula, already had that schedule in place. Um, oftentimes their schedule, um, they have to work around the Blue Hill Fair. It's also my understanding that School Union 96, which is Darrell Stonington, AOS 91, which includes Mount Desert Island, and Beach Hill will also be making a change in their calendars. So certainly as we have tuition students that we share, we also have HCTC. Um, this is an option that will afford our staff adequate time to make final preparations. And I think it will also give families a little more time to help sort out whether or not we need to find daycare um, and some of the other logistics in their family pieces. So this is something we'd be bringing forward to the uh, board at its August meeting, but I wanted to put it on everyone's radar this evening. Um, so I, I think it's, it's an appropriate and positive change for all involved and it will be consistent with what's happening across the county. Um, a couple of other pieces that are related to funding, but not necessarily with the uh, planning group. One is funding. Uh, I think it's important for our community members to hear this. In addition to the planning that the school board did uh, through budget season in preparation for any additional or unexpected expenses, and you know, we talked a little bit about how we can use our fund balance and reserve accounts to hold in uh, reserve funding to support unanticipated expenses. Um, in addition to that, and in addition to the $214,000 in CARES Act funds to support the reopening of schools, last Friday on the 17th, Governor Mills allocated $165 million from the Coronavirus Relief Fund, CRF funds, to public schools. Ellsworth School Department's share of this is $1.257 million, okay, uh, which is gonna be very helpful. We can use those funds for any unplanned needs emerging from COVID-19, Okay, and these could be emergency pieces or pieces helping us to prepare for the start of school. And we can backdate those to March 16th when the school's closed. However, we cannot use them to replace budgeted items that were taken out or to replace lost revenues. Um, the things that we're looking at to use this money for, one, to provide additional staff training that we haven't been able to uh, identify and plan for already. Um, to prepare our facilities for the restart of the school year in all aspects, to continue to purchase PPE, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, to purchase cleaning and disinfecting supplies and equipment, 
and to address IT needs in the event of the need for remote instruction. You know, our IT department did a lot of great work last spring, has learned from the things that we had as challenges, um, but there will still be additional needs. Uh, so that, that, that is a very positive sign. One of the challenges is the $214,000 in CARES Act funding, we have until September of 2022 to expend. The 1.257 million, we have until December 30th of this year to expend. So um, I, I met with um, curriculum director, uh, Foreman Ramos and our business manager, Carolyn Heller earlier today uh, to start putting the application together for those funds. Um, but again, it's a, it's a very welcome, welcome uh, piece of news that will help us get our schools uh, prepared. Um, PPE, personal protective equipment. Um, in addition to some purchases that we've already made, you know, I purchased through a Southern Maine Educational Collaborative, a supply of uh, face shields, masks, and clear face masks. Also a group that um, board member Abby Miller uh, works with uh, is going to be uh, producing a thousand masks uh, for us. We're also gonna be receiving um, supplies of KN95 and N95 masks, disposable gowns, three-ply gloves, disposable, excuse me, gloves, three-ply disposable masks, face shields, cloth face masks, clear face masks for students and staff who need to be able to see um, each other's mouths, um, FEMA masks, which are usable, hand sanitizer, sanitizing wipes, and face mask straps. The supply that we're receiving through the Department of Ed um, that the department has allocated funding to cover is supposed to last us through a formula they used based upon our student counts and staff counts in the Department of Ed's NEO system, supposed to last us through December. Um, I know there is in the works the potential of another federal package that would provide money to schools that would hopefully supplement that. Um, there's also still money in the CRF funds that the, the governor allocated 165 million to schools uh, that may be able to come back to schools. Um, but we also have uh, the funding to continue to purchase what we need. So I, I think we're well set up in the area of personal protective equipment. So uh, again, we're working on, with a goal of presenting a plan for the restart of school at a workshop next Monday evening. You know, we targeted the 1st of August and we are keenly aware of the need for parents and community members to have this information to facilitate their planning for their families. But while we're keenly aware of that, we also appreciate the boards and everybody's understanding of the many complex variables changing guidance and requirements as we complete this framework process. Um, you know, it, it's a really complex task and in, in conversations I've had with families and conversations I've had with um, our staff members and conversations with uh, community members, neighbors, um, when we start talking about one or two pieces of information, questions on those things come about and become questions for the planning group to consider. Um, Again, we, we intend to present next week, but please know whatever we present next week will continue to be subject to change uh, based upon changes in data, the changes in the color-coded risk designation that come out every two weeks, or guidance or requirements that are posted by the Department of Ed. Um, we do have some members of our planning group here this evening if there are some questions, and I suspect there will be some. Um, but before we turn to them, I can just would like to provide a couple of things that um, Jackie Sandone and Chris Reinig, our nurses, provided. Um, in addition to the work they're doing with the school nurses group statewide and also Dr. McGregor, they are working on a letter to remind parents to call their child's PCP to review the vaccine record. And again, under current law, the expectations that students need to stay current with the required immunizations for school entry. And my understanding is that's even if we go remote. Um, they have been talking about um, promoting people getting a flu shot, but again, that's not something the school can require. Um, they're also focusing attention on another requirement that we have, which is to have an isolation room in each of our schools. We need to have an isolation room um, that allows us to deal with students who may be exhibiting symptoms of COVID, uh, a room for students who um, are coming in, um, they may have bumped their knee and need a Band-Aid, um, or they need to take medication. Um, you, know, you certainly wanna keep those students separated and a triage space and satellite stations for minor first aid. That's another part of their efforts and they're looking at that at HCTC, EEMS, and also our adult education program. And even though our adult education program is not housed in one of our schools, we have similar requirements that we have to have in place when our programs are housed in other facilities. Another thing that um, Chris and Jackie are looking at are ways to minimize student traffic throughout the building. 
I think this is easier at the elementary level than at the middle school and the high school level. You know, a couple of examples. One would be um, a nurse that they talked about in one of the webinars talked about she is going to the student rather than having the student traverse through the school to come to the nurse. They're looking at how that may work. Another piece that we're looking at is student cohort groups. You know, it may be easier at some levels to have students move rather than, excuse me, have teachers move rather than students move. That's one person moving rather than others. But again, that's a logistical challenge for our staff. Um, that's not a requirement for any teachers that are wa watching or listening out there. It's just something we're looking at. Um, another piece that they are working on, and this is something I intended to mention tonight as well. They're working on a letter to encourage our families to help their children adjust to wearing a mask or a face shield now. Um, that will be uh, very important to helping us adjust to having students wearing their masks or face shields in school. Um, it, it may be a change for many people, but again, I reiterate, it is not an option. It's not something that we're suggesting. We are required to have all students wear them. So any help that we can get from our families out there to help to train and prepare their uh, sons and daughters for that uh, would be very helpful. And Chris and Jackie are looking at providing some information uh, to help with that. Um, and certainly the other thing they said was if there are questions that come up specifically for them, you can please provide them. You can provide them either through the Q&A box here, which I think we can get copies of, or you could send them directly either to me or to uh, Chris or Jackie, and you can find their email addresses um, on the school web pages. So I appreciate that. And I, again, I would say we have members of our team here tonight. So if there are questions that you have of our members of our planning group, questions of me that I can answer, um, I would turn the flo floor over. I have some questions. I was just trying to see if anybody else had unmuted. <laughs> um, so I guess in seeing that we didn't have a huge response in surveys um, and, and speaking to parents myself, um, there was some confusion there on whether that was um, going straight to uh, just choosing in-person or the remote. And I guess it would be a good, probably a good um, bit of information if we could fill parents in on um, the fact that if we're going to be hybrid, which is what we're, we're speaking of because of the social distancing requirements, what those days in school would look like for their children. So you've gone down through the recommendations or the requirements, excuse me, from the state. Um, have we come to a conclusion with the committee on the um, at-home self-check? Like, is that going to be um, something that's done prior to a child getting on the bus? Or is that something that's going to be sent to the school? Is it going to be an app? Like, those are some of the questions that I've, I've heard come up or is, are is that all going to be taken care of when the child comes to our front doors, which could lead to congestion? Um, oh, I, heard, oh, I, I heard a couple of questions, Jen, but I, may, maybe you want to finish. Go ahead. Where, no, where um, you... if you want to start there, that's fine. Sure. I'll start with the pieces that I can answer. Um, and yes, with the survey, you know, first of all, um, with the survey going out, you know, Responses for 500 people is pretty good when you're looking at surveys. However, we did get a couple of questions. Uh, you know, within the first 24 hours, we had um, 175 surveys returned. So many people um, took the information in the letter and were able to answer that. For the people that contacted us, um, I know I reached out to the people that contacted me directly and answered the questions and assured them that it was not binding. Uh, assured mm -hmm. them that there were many questions that they would like to have answered that we don't have answers for yet but that we needed the information to help us determine if a choice model would work. And we also sent out a reminder to families clarifying what we were asking for and again, clarifying that it was not going to be binding at this point in time just to help us. So to answer the question on a hybrid model that has choice, the intent behind that would be five days per week. Again, a model of choice, families who want to choose to have their children attend school, and families who want to have their children in a remote program, um, would be selecting that, um, and it would be for five days a week. If that's what parents are comfortable with and their students are comfortable with, if we can accommodate that, uh, that addresses a lot of challenges. With regard to the second piece, Jen, 
and to anyone else that's thinking about this, that's one of the things that the instruction and assessment group is looking at is, if we can't make the choice model work, what are the days going to be? Um, you know, I, I can defer that to our administrator here tonight. Um, we do not have one model in place that is consistent across the district. I know that they have been meeting um, along, so I, I will let them address that. But I think you also asked another question um, that wasn't related to that, Jen, that I could answer. Can you refresh me what it was? Yeah, I, well, I think what I was talk talking about was the self-checks. Yep. <clears throat> self-checks, self um, the concept of an app is, is an option that's available. Um, but what is expected of us is to provide information to families sent out in advance um, with clear graphics of these are the things that you need to check on before you send your child to school. And the expectation is that our families are going to do that. Now, certainly, um, the other piece is we're going to have to train many members of our staff to be looking for symptoms so that they could, students can be referred to our school nurses for a further check. There will also be similar information provided to all staff members, myself included, in advance of the start of the school year. That's something that Chris and Jackie are working on. And if you look in the framework documents that the Department of Ed has provided, the ones predating July 17th had a longer list. The ones uh, the one from July 17th that came out uh, had a shorter list. I've asked Jackie and Chris to work with the Department of Ed group to find out why is the list shorter. We want to make sure that we cover the pieces that need to be covered so that when students and staff come to school, they've been checked for symptoms at home, they've been checked for temperature, they've been checked for things they need to be checked for so you can make an informed decision to come to school. And again, as I said in the outset, that's something that's going to be a change for many of us. You know, Many of us get up in the morning, we don't feel all that great, we go to work anyway. Um, that's that's going to be part of the new normal. So um, the concept of an app is there. Again, one of the challenges of that, and I would defer to our IT people, is making sure that everybody has access to the app. Certainly, an app would facilitate it because an app, from my understanding, would send that information directly to the school, so we would know if a student is staying home or a student is going to be coming. So I can answer those pieces with regard to the work the instruction and assessment group is doing on what the days may look like. I know there are models with an A and a B group or a maroon and a gray group. Um, to our members of those committees, if you'd like to address um, where your conversations are with that right now and what we're trying to get to, if it has to be an alternating schedule model. I can speak to that and uh, people can fill in uh, whenever they want to. Um, so the other hybrid piece that we were looking at is, um, you know, those, stu those uh, students and parents that want a fully remote learning experience, we would still honor that. And so that would be in place. And then the rest would be, um, we would have a maroon group and a gray group. And we would split those children up by household. And it, there's a lot of variations. It could be um, by alphabet, um, a lot of different things. But if you have four children in the household, and they're sprinkled through K through 12 in our system, they would go to school in the same day. And that would help with some daycare issues and, and some other issues. And it would be an every other day schedule for those kids. So on one week, the maroon group would go to school on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The gray group would go on Tuesday and Thursday. And that would flip flop the next week. And so what would it would allow is we would have a little bit more control over how many kids are in each class in each classroom. And um, what the off days could possibly look like is they may be able to chime into the classroom uh, via our cameras that we're looking at, or possibly just they are responsible for work that has continued. So if they go to school on Monday, teacher could give them um, homework or work that they need to do on Tuesday. It could be on their own. And then on Wednesday, um, they would have in-person instruction again. And so it would kind of alleviate all the Zoom uh, meetings and, and things like that that were going on in the spring. And they would be in contact with a teacher every other day um, throughout, throughout um, this experience. And so, you know, kind of in a nutshell, that's what it would look like. So the remote parents would still be taken care of. They still have that choice. And students that come to school or choose are choosing to come to school, they would be in a maroon group or a gray group, uh, K through 12, and um, it would be a regular, a regular schedule for them um, while they're there.
that actually answers a lot, Dan. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, in addition, with some feedback we've gotten from parents via email, we also are considering uh, possibly breaking up the cohorts, not, a, not additionally by household, but also by geographic location. When Mr. Higgins talked earlier about that community supporting each other, that's one of the suggestions that we had um, from parents. And also, we are also looking at, I know that Mr. Clifford said every other day scheduling. We've had some feedback from parents where they were interested in having a consistent days versus having an every other day schedule with concerns to daycare. So we are also still discussing that. Um, but initially, our model did include an every other day piece. Thank you. I think the the other concern that we want to address is when we had when we originally um, had the surveys back in June, we had a lot of parents say, um, you know, I was working and trying to facilitate learning during remote learning for my child, and so when we are taking into account the alternating days or the the set days um, where there are some point your child will be remote, we're talking probably more about remote learning versus remote instruction so that the learning can happen um, on times that accommodate families uh, rather than having to log in specific times necessarily. Um, so we are discussing that option as well to help um, because we did get a lot of that feedback as well. So we're really trying to be thoughtful in how we address some of these concerns or issues that we've heard from families um, and taking into account all of those scenarios. I appreciate that, Erica, too, because I know um, I mentioned in the last meeting that one of our uh, larger numbers that came from the survey were how many um, parents and adults did not feel like they could adequately provide the adult assistance to their child during the remote um, learning in the spring. And I think that was a big concern of, of mine um, going forward for our parents is that if their children do need to be in a daycare setting, um, especially with the younger kids, that kind of synchronized learning that might work well for older students because they could be home alone and, um, you know, or, or be in a setting where they could maybe have a little community group and where the younger children might have a little bit harder time with that. I know it's difficult to have a, you know, six or seven year old chiming in on their classroom and they've got to sit there all day. Um, so I didn't see that that would work real well, especially if we are talking about that age group that, you know, mom and dad are working and we do, we do have to have them go to daycare. So the fact that maybe, like you, you said, you know, more of a, a remote learning, but not necessarily re remote instruction would be, you know, super, super way for parents to maybe still be involved, but not have to sit there all day and maybe have to be doing their own work. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I mean, there are opportunities too. like, for example, just using the middle school schedule, there are opportunities during the day where those kids who are on their off day and not and during in person instruction could have opportunities to check in with their teachers remotely via zoom um, during like study hall times or RTI times. Um, should they have any questions about their remote learning. So it's not like we're just setting those kids off sending those kids off to, you know, fend for themselves on those off days but we would have a plan in place to make sure that kids feel that they're supported during that time as well. Super, thank you. So I can jump in and say that um, looking at kids with special needs through all of this will really mirror what each grade level is doing as far as scheduling goes. But as always, we're gonna be looking at how to meet student needs in the best way we can with the resources that we have available to us um, is following the safety guidelines. Um, we're also looking at um, mental health needs and there's a subcommittee working on that and we have some pretty fantastic people which I mentioned in our last um, session who have been working since March on this and we've taken a lot of their suggestions and put them together at this point and we're reviewing what will actually um, go into place but something that we're looking at as well is that um, staff also has needs and this is very complicated for everybody, so I want to make sure that, that the public is aware and that y'all that are staff out there are aware that we are thinking about you and what your needs are as well. And as always, if anyone has questions as parents about a child with um, disabilities and special services or 504, please contact me directly. 
because I really want to talk about um, what things look like and help allay some of your concerns and collaborate with you. So, and I'll speak to HCTC. Um, I continue to meet with obviously our district leadership team about HCTC. Um, we have another weekly meeting Thursday with all the area high school principals uh, to kind of do another check in. We met last week and decided we needed to start meeting weekly. Um, I can tell you the other high school principals, no matter what is decided, are highly committed to making sure that their students that are going to attend HCTC will be scheduled in such a way that they can access their CTE programming. Um, we have a fantastic group of principals and I really believe um, that I'll end up working with each high school uh, to possibly individually schedule each student so that we can make that happen uh, for the kids that want to continue coming to HCTC in the fall, whether it's in person or remote. Mr. Markosian, do you have some questions that people have sent in? You know, I had one question that I got early today, but it's already been answered. It was about uh, whether masks are going to be required. And I think Dan answered that quite clearly. That's the only thing I've gotten so far. There's some in the Q&A up top, too. Right. Hey, whoops, I didn't see those. Th th thank you. With, this is from Andrew Ferd. With spacing requirements, we will be prohibited from doing group activities, either using manipulatives, science labs, et cetera. Will the district be able to use CARE funding to provide enough materials for each student? Uh, Mr. Markosian, and I, I, I'll take that one to start with. Um, I believe that's Andrew Ford, um, which it's oh, a yeah. great question, Mr. Ford. Um, the spacing requirements are still going to be maintained. Um, again, that, that's not a choice. That's a requirement. Um, I think that's a question you want to take back to the uh, planning group. And I know it, it, at your level, it's the uh, leadership team that's working with Ms. Gabinelli. But yes, we are building the budget now. So if there are types of things that we need to ensure that we can provide the adequate manipulatives for labs and those types of activities, um, please make sure that we get them. Uh, it's, it's a process that we started uh, with the budget today. You know, we just received the allocation numbers last week. Um, so that, you know, that's a great question and it, it's something we have to be cognizant of. All right. Uh, Joanne asked, any chance of upgrading the computers to MacBooks? Many universities don't recommend a, the Chromebook. It would be nice to have a smooth transition from high school to university online learning. Mr. Higgins, do you want me to answer that? Or I, was do you say, want to I, was, I was looking for you on the screen, April. Yes. Um, I saw you looking at <laughs> looking for me. Um, at this time, there isn't a plan to upgrade students to MacBook Airs. Um, there are specific cohorts of students who do utilize those devices. Um, some of AP courses online require those. Um, some specific programming requires those. Um, some digital art students take them. Bridge students have them. But um, our students will be using uh, Chromebooks uh, grades uh, 9 through 12. Okay. Another question here from, again, from Andrew Ford. Will families be given specific requirements for what is acceptable for masks? Uh, yes, that's something our school nurses are working on. You know, there's a more detailed document that comes along with the Department of Ed's framework that recommends that families provide their own masks. A couple of things. One is we will make sure that families know what masks are acceptable. And I think that's important for all of us. And, you know, we are receiving masks from the Department of Education. Uh, so we can support families that can't provide their own masks. But uh, in short, the answer is yes, we'll provide that information. And there may be families that want to provide their own masks, um, even if the school does have some available. All right, I got a few more questions have come in. Um, uh, well, there's one more from Andrew Ford. For families that choose remote instruction, how would that instruction be provided, especially students taking AP classes? not any teacher would be able to fill in. Instruction assessment group? Well, I'll speak to the AP class. Um, 
we would have to get creative. Uh, you're right. Um, and again, back to the, um, the owl cameras, that would really help where you can be in side of a classroom and uh, remotely. And um, so that would make things a lot easier. Um, but that's something that we're, we're still looking at and haven't made decisions on. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would have to be covered. Anybody that's, that's signed up for an AP class, um, we'll get the full experience and uh, we'll just have to be creative with the instruction and what that would look like. Okay. Um, I got another question via email from Denise Morse. What are we going to do about special ed students? I have one who goes for two classes and while the support was good, it wasn't enough, but this child cannot tolerate a mask all day due to sensory issues. Furthermore, myself and family members are high risk. She needs that one-on-one, -on -one, quote, let me show you, unquote, to figure it out. To add to the problem, I'm a single parent and still working, so my time is limited to helping her understand her work myself. I have many parent friends that feel the same. Our kids are going to struggle if they need to stay at home, such as mine. I think with regard to the requirements on the masks, I would touch that and then I would defer to um, Mrs. McKecker Murphy on the, on the special needs piece. With regard to the masks and sensory issues, one of the pieces that the department's requirements afford us is uh, the use of a face shield. Um, whether or not that is something that can be used, I do not know in the specific case. I would encourage you to have that conversation with Mrs. McEachern Murphy. But in terms of providing supports for any of our special needs students, and I, I guess I would say, please answer in general. You know, we certainly don't want to um, go specific and, and deal with FERPA issues, but I would defer to Mrs. McEachern Murphy on the other part of that answer. That is hard to answer specifically because of FERPA issues. So a case by case kind of analysis of this couldn't happen um, in a public forum, but case by case is exactly what we will do. We're going to have to collaborate with you as uh, families of students with disabilities and talk about what is going to work and find that um, balance for what works for you. And that will include education about how to help um, your child at home, and you've heard um, Mr. Higgins talk earlier about looking at different kinds of daycare options and different community collaborations. So that's where we're going to have to really talk um, closely, individually, case by case, and looking at the unique needs of each child and um, make those plans um, individually with you. And that's really, it's a very general answer, and I know that, but each case is that different. Each child is very different and each need will be different. So it's a different conversation each time. And it depends on the family construct as well as um, how well um, your child is um, able to interact in a virtual forum versus in person and um, also come to school meeting those safety requirements. But again, please, anyone listening, reach out to me. I'm, I'm on their webpage and I would love to have a conversation with you personally about how to make this work for your child because special education really is all about um, meeting those needs in that unique way for the child. Um, this doesn't discount 504, that's regular, regular education. If you also have a child with a 504 plan, reach out to me, please. Let's talk about what this is gonna look like. I hear you loud and clear on things need to be um, changed and improved. And you've got some very dedicated uh, teachers who are scrambling and thinking and coming up with some amazing ideas now as to what they can do in their classrooms to make the experience better for the kids um, when we return in the fall. Thank you. Uh, I got another couple of questions. Uh, one from Rebecca Faulkner, actually she's got two. What are parents supposed to do on days when their child or children are at home and the parents have to work? Paying for daycare may not be an option for some families. And uh, she has another, go ahead. I'll say the, the response to that piece is, as, as I said earlier, one of the things that we're looking at is the potential for uh, space and potentially a low cost daycare option working through uh, YMCA with Director Farragher. So that may be an option. The, the other piece that I mentioned uh, is uh, hearing from some parents about community collaboratives. Uh, there may be families that can connect with other families. So if it's a day that their child is doing remote learning, um, there can be a collaboration there. Paul, you're muted. You're muted, Paul. 
Sorry. Uh, another question from Ms. Faulkner when Mr. For Andrew Ford asked the same uh, question about teachers and staff who have children. Um, what are they supposed to do when their uh, child or children are going to be home on the days that the teacher has to work? And I think it, it's a reiteration of the, the previous answer to Mrs. Faulkner's question. But I think there's another piece, and, and this becomes an HR question. Um, one of the things that we have sent out to all of our staff members is a request to get back to us if you have or believe you're going to have a medical or at-risk situation that will prevent you from coming back to work, and if remote work was available, would you be willing to be part of a remote instructional piece? Um, we have had some teachers reach out and say they have a situation like this, but they would be willing or able to do or be a remote teacher. So that is another option. Again, it's it's looking for options that we're trying to work uh, through with uh, Director Farragher to see if there are spaces available. Also family and community collaboratives, uh, but also for some of our teachers, yes, uh, it may be an opportunity and it, it may work out well for them to be a uh, remote instructor. That's certainly an option. Paul doesn't have any more. I actually had another question. That's all I have uh, from the public. Okay. Um, what are the guidelines in regards to PE? That's one of the questions. And what activity would our children be getting during the day? Um, but I also have another question. I'm wondering if you can update, if there's been any update from the MPA um, on fall sports, but also in conjunction with that, um, how do extracurricular activities such as the arts, how, where do those fall and how do those begin in the fall? Um, I, think we, we, I think you've talked about masks, Jen. You know, one of the pieces that I did not mention about masks is a requirement is that we provide students with mask breaks. So students who are in school, one of the places for a mask break is obviously when they're eating lunch. Um, the other piece that we need to do in is, is to look at and uh, how s students can take a mass break, preferably outside if the weather is good, so students can get out. That would provide a little bit of activity. We're still working on what a recess would look like, particularly at the elementary and middle level, because we're looking at what are the protocols that are going to be necessary to ensure that any playground equipment used can be cleaned and sanitized. Um, so we're looking at ways that we can provide physical activity for students. We know we need to do that incorporate that with mass breaks. So I think that that can answer one of the questions and things that we're looking at. Uh, extra co and extracurricular activities. I, I think the, the philosophy and I would welcome our instructional group um, principals to weigh in on this as well, um, is to continue to hold those activities uh, to the extent possible. And I know you heard Mrs. Cutney talk about earlier in, the, in tonight's meeting about how the group that she advises continue to meet through Zoom um, throughout uh, the school closure. We'd like to be able to have those activities continue and we would still need to maintain proper spacing um, for those students. As far as the MPA, I know they've, they've moved their fall sports season back. Uh, Mr. Clifford, I know you've been working more closely with Mr. Frost. I, I don't have the dates in front of me. Is that something you could be a little more specific on? Yeah, so they, they did move the start of fall sports to uh, September 8th also. And um, they're still making decisions you know, by the week and, and pretty much daily as far as fall sports and um, what they're going to look like. But they, I know they have tossed around um, playing locally or regionalizing, regionalizing um, schedules as, as much as they can and uh, no long distance games or anything like that. Um, playoffs are up in the air in every sport. I do know that. Um, so it'll, it'll look different this year. Thank you. Ms. Miller? Um, just a quick update. Um, how are we doing with um, getting certain pieces of um, equipment, like the foggers to um, sanitize the buses and any, any word on any of the um, 
UVC lights and stuff like that? Uh, UVC lights, Chuck is uh, checking references uh, to see who else is using it. There are some concerns on, on health and safety that he and um, his assistant Josh have identified also staff members have, but we're still looking at are there safe options that we can use. Uh, with regard to foggers, yes, what they've identified is um, what is a relatively low cost option. And I don't know the exact um, compound, Abby, but it's a hospital grade material where it can be sprayed on um, using a, a relatively small uh, backpack. Uh, in the time that it's used, it can be used on multiple surfaces where it will be sprayed on, it will disinfect and kill any virus and dry. Um, so there's, there's some positive movement on that. And I can also say, and Mr. Saunders is here, he may want to, or may be able to add into this, but Mr. Turnbull, Mr. Saunders, Mr. Daly have been working together um, to order some of those supplies because some of those materials are things that they're all going to use in their specific departments. So I, I think Abby is to say it's, it's positive movement um, and uh, we're really encouraged, particularly with the, the, the misting um, apparatus that I just described. Donnie, is there anything that you could add to that? Uh, the compound that we use in the foggers is called vital oxide. Um, and in the guns that we've used, it electromagnetically attaches to all surfaces and it, uh, it kills on contact and it dries very, very quickly. Uh, so it's a spray and leave process. Um, when we got together and talked about it with the custodial staff, they had a, a lot less expensive option. Um, it was a container with a battery pack that pressurized the vital oxide and it came out through a nozzle. Um, and those were, those were like $180 as opposed to like $800 for the guns. So it, it was a eye opener. But I think, I think that product will work on just about everything um, unless something can't take a mist. And in that case, the UV light would be an option. And, and maybe just to add to that, thank you, Donnie. Um, we're looking at it for, for all kinds of pieces, manipulatives, physical education equipment. You know, one of the questions that came up, we do have a number of chairs. Uh, we do have a number of chairs that are a, a fabric. We're trying to determine if it will actually work on those or if we're gonna to need to take those chairs out of the mix. Uh, but that's, that's, uh, that's what those, those gentlemen are working on. And you know, I've heard you say it before, Abby, they're doing a great job. They're uncovering all, uh, all stones to find out what we need. So thank you for asking. Paul and Brenda, if, if there are no other questions at this point in time, and there may be still some coming in, you know, we've been talking predominantly about pre-K through 12 um, and CTE. You know, Director Sargent is here tonight. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to give a, her an opportunity to give a brief update. Sure. Andy? Yeah. So um, adult ed is in a new space, which is exciting. We're not wired for sound. Um, or internet at this point, but we're getting close. Um, so we're looking at that space and there's some, some barriers that we hope to overcome. Uh, but our plan for a hybrid model would be to bring all of our incoming students in. We do an extensive intake and assessment process. And we'll add to that um, the sort of lo logistics and technology aspect of um, the ability to do remote learning and folks that can do that. And for some, what we learned last spring, it's a better option, uh, we'll do that. And then we'll do face-to-face -face with folks that can't do that or because of their learning needs, um, it's not appropriate. So we're hoping that that will work. Um, our biggest challenge right now is that we're, um, we have a storage room, a bathroom, a storage, a, a uh, utility closet, and the rest of it is 2,100 square feet of open space, which means that we don't have a place to um, isolate somebody with COVID. We just discovered that today. So as with all of these situations, there's a lot of research and a lot of uh, we think we're all set and then there's an obstacle. So uh, we're doing our best to do what we can to um, address all the 
uh, requirements. And uh, we are really, really excited to be able to be face to face with our students. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. With all of our facilities, do we have um, some outside spaces um, kind of ready to go to have uh, our, our students and our staff have mass breaks? I'll defer to the principals on that. So at HCTC, we have an area we've designated, but we don't have tents or anything as of right now, Abby. So our plan is, is that we'll have to stagger schedules with programs um, to use the lawn space that's in front of our parking area, um, where currently there are a couple of picnic tables. Um, those will be moved so that kids are maintaining their social distancing outside. Um, but we don't have a plan for when inclement weather hits, what that would look like um, for an outside space as of right now. We're, we're the same at the high school level, just uh, designating outside space for classrooms. And we're looking at scheduling consistent breaks uh, per grade, per teacher, per grade level, taking uh, in consideration the uh, gathering rule as well. So we're really starting to get into that detailed level, but uh, we're just starting that piece. Same at the middle school, I'm working with my leadership team to try to hammer out some of those details. It's going to take some coordination given all of our classrooms and the number of kids, but um, I think we can make it work. Thank you. Well, do you have another question? Yes, one more question came in. Again, from Andrew Ford. Um, have there been any thought to staff or students with hearing impairments where wearing a mask would make hearing difficult? Will technology be provided for those with these issues? The general answer I will go to was uh, yes, uh, with the requirements, once again, uh, masks are required, but for people that have a medical issue or other issue that will prevent a mask, uh, a face shield is uh, an acceptable alternative. With regard to the specific pieces about assistive technology, you know, I'll defer to Mrs. McEachern Murphy. If there's assistive technology that is needed that isn't already in place, then that's something that we can certainly look at. Um, if it, it, again, it's a, it's a very specific case, so I would have to know details, but um, I would want to hear from that family to know exactly what it is we need to be doing. And I want to reassure you that our speech and language clinicians and our staff at Techs and special ed case managers are included are all thinking about the clear face shield. We even have some people who have already gone out and bought their own stuff to make sure that kids can see their faces. It's a, it's a real concern for them. Um, also, Oh. If, if, it's, if, it's not a, if it's not a student or if it's a staff member that we're talking about that has that type of an issue, please go directly to your direct supervisor or um, you can pose the question to our business manager, Carolyn Heller. Actually, I'll say pose the question to Carolyn Heller so we could uh, direct that information to where it needs to go to avoid any uh, FERPA type issues. I'm going to take, different... you... yeah, take a different spin on Mr. Ford's question. Um, one of the things that we are started looking at today um, were possibly some devices, um, some lapel mics. Some schools are offering their students some lapel or their staff members some lapel mics. So when they're speaking, they're connected into the room audio and it's enhanced for students to be able to hear. I just started that um, process looking at options today. I'm not sure if it was something that would work. Um, I was going to approach, I'm probably was gonna approach our BPA department. I know that we have some lapel mics that we could test to see if it was something that would, would work in that situation. So it's a little bit of a different spin on Mr. Ford's question, but it's something that we're looking at. I mean, we are really uh, focused on, on the details for this process for our students and parents. Dan, I have a question uh, for you. Have you heard anything, any talk, discussion from 
Department of Ed, the state, um, or the main CDC about whether pool testing or rapid antigen testing will be something that may become available to our state. Both of those tests are designed to, or they have the ability to screen large, larger populations of people much less expensively and much more rapidly. They're not as accurate on an individual basis, but they're good at screening and figuring out if the virus is making, starting to make any inroads into a community. They're, they're most useful for communities that have low transmission rates like we do, but it's, it would be, a, it could, it could become a way of um, gaining assurance that we have zero, you know, very few or zero cases within, say, Hancock County, and that therefore we can relax, we might potentially be able to relax some of these restrictions and open more fully the way we were before this pandemic came, with the understanding that if the virus started to become present here and make inroads, we would have to make adjustments. But um, I just was wondering if you've heard anything on the state level about, about these types of tests. Short answer, Paul, is no, I have not. Uh, the most recent thing I heard on testing was what Dr. Shaw released in the press conference last Friday, uh, which was people with symptoms can go through their PCP, get a test. Um, yeah. I am an advocate of, um, of a testing program. Uh, I am participating in a webinar tomorrow with other superintendents across the state uh, with Jackson Lab. Um, I don't know if this will provide any further information with regard to what you're asking for, Paul, but I know there's a, there's a conversation on there with regard to testing. I, I don't know where it will lead. Uh, mm -hmm. but short answer to your question is no, I've not received anything, anything from the DOE. Um, okay, thanks. Dan, I had a question too. At, at this time, does it appear that there would be a requirement for testing prior to school for staff and students? I, I have not heard of one, Jen, no. Okay. All right, thank you. I, I would say I, I've not heard of it, but I know that there are some people who are advocating for it and would like to see it, but n nothing official. Any further comments or questions? No. Nope. I've got none. Okay. Um, I don't believe I need to vote to adjourn. This is Thomas. Can I just make a couple of closing comments before you go? Yeah. Again, just want to thank everyone. Thank thank all of our uh, planning group who's here tonight for all the great work they continue to do, uh, and just want to reiterate to everyone out there. The, the focus that we have is how we can return students and staff to school safely. Again, I reiterate that, students and staff to school safely. We're following the guidelines, we're following the requirements, we're putting in place the pieces that are designed to do that. And again, I just wanna appreciate the work that our group is doing. And uh, you know, our, our target once again is next Monday night to come forward and uh, have a plan that we can put forth. Um, I've said it all along, it's an ambitious timeline. And we know families need the information, but we're gonna come forth Monday night with, uh, with information on what it's going to look like. And if things change subsequent to that, we'll keep you updated. But thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for asking all the questions. Appreciate it. Thank you everybody for your efforts. Have a good evening, everyone. Or what's good left of it? <laughs> good night. Good night.